that thought process is how we end up with a lot of these quirky little things. Yeah. And so if I was yeah. going to take like my CZ457, right? Yeah. And I already like my 22 long rifle length magazines and I want a 17 cartridge, I would choose a cartridge or make a cartridge that's going to be compatible with my magazines and the rest of the rifle system. What's up, everybody? We've got an interesting one for you here today. Across the table from Mark and myself, actually, and two, if you're looking at us on YouTube, you may notice that Mark appears a bit different than you're used to. Um, got, a, got a summer cut, Jen. Jim. Is that what that is? Yeah. It's also, summer. we're a little worried about him, too, because I don't know if it was the, uh, I don't know if it was the weekend or what, or if it was the beard being trimmed that also apparently housed, you said, the synapses. Yeah, that's where I was keeping them. Um, so anyway, if you hear a, a stutter or two from Mark, he's like, Samson, we've cut the beard, and now uh, <laughs> that, that, that's just what's going on. So, But we'll be all right. We'll make it through. We're good. Just got to relearn. Um, okay, anyway, small bore. Oh, yeah, across the table from Mark and I is Ryan Muckenhern and also Seth Toy. Uh, now, these guys joined us a while back. We talked all about 22s, competition 22, all that sort of thing, like 22 long rifle. Uh, but there is a, a myriad of uh, calibers, chamberings, and, uh, and bore diameters and all that stuff, well below even 22, real tiny little guys. And so you guys have helped us even just as we were sitting here prior to starting define the nature of what we're going to talk about today. And, and actually, we're going to talk about stuff that's even smaller, for the most part, than twenty two caliber. 20s, 17s, sub-17s. So. Just little babies. Little fellas. That's right. <laughs> I'm excited because we've gotten some requests from people around stuff, especially a lot of the oddball 17s out there and some of these just like crazy hypervelocity things. or just really little... Baby, uh, baby bullets going down real tiny bore barrels. Uh, so how do we start this one off, guys? Do we start with one thing, Seth? You mentioned. I mean, do do you have to start with at least the twenty two, like the long rifles, the shorts, the BBs, and that sort of thing, to at least kind of get where we're at, where we're going? Or yeah, I think it'd be helpful what? to talk about the history of really small rim fires. Kind of touch on the twenty two long rifle again, and move into the other variety of teeny guys, and then yeah. I think twenty. I think twenty two set um, the high mark on the small caliber, and that we had twenty two rim fire before we had a lot of center fire, and then we went into center fire, and then people were like yeah, that that bore diameter is kind of attractive, <laughs> and then we started making things small, and then inevitably made them smaller. So yeah, twenty two is important. It is. Yeah. Now is that just is that just what people started shooting small twenty twos, and they were just sort of like. This is awesome. It's so awesome. We should make it even smaller. Yeah, I think so. That never happens. No. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, there's a bigger is better philosophy. Yeah. Uh, but it did happen. It did happen. So yeah, let's let's do that. The twenty two is one that's just so uh, it's so useful for so many things. It is because you can do target shooting with. I mean, heck, we got people shooting precision rifle with it for Pete's sake, out to like five hundred yards sometimes. And then also you go out and you do a little bit of yard work with it, yep. and <laughs> it, it, it takes care of the, of business there. Now I'm wondering to myself. Now, for example, I'm thinking right off the bat, like I have a seventeen HMR. Okay, now that's a good one for yard work. And, uh, but there's, there's all these other ones. Like how did people start making like all these ones for very specific applications or was it just sort of this exercise and to just see how far the rabbit hole could go with what we could do with these little tiny bullets? I mean, why, why did we even come up with stuff smaller than 22? I think both. Uh, so if I want to jump into this from the center fire side of things, I think of cartridges and rifles that we went from, um, like especially in lever actions, we went from companion cartridges to your revolver to now making the rifle stand alone with cartridges like 218B, um, some of the, well, the 25 caliber stuff that was all companion cartridges. But like, let's look at 218B. What do you mean by companion cartridge? So if you carried uh, on your hip a 3220 revolver mm -hmm. or a 4440, or something like that, then you would have a rifle chambered in the same thing. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. 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 Right. Lever gun, yeah, usually yeah. probably. Yeah. And um, then as like me metallic cartridge development 
continued on and then people started reloading. Then we started tweaking stuff and we started coming up with stuff like 218V, for instance, which is a varminting cartridge. And it was a way that you could take your lever gun that you were familiar with the, the mechanics and, and uh, you know, the whole setup and, and now push the envelope a little bit further for varminting or target shooting, um, enter something like the 218B, um, which by today's standards is really anemic. Um, and we still didn't have telescopic weapon sites in any kind of, uh, you know, commonality at that point. So we were still shooting irons. But well, while we're talking about it, what is the 218B then? Like uh, how, how would you describe that in cartridge language? Commercialized Wildcat, pistol, cartridge, neck down to 22 caliber. Okay. Okay. For use in a lever action gun. I kind of like it. It's cute. Super cute. Man, it gets confusing when people start calling stuff that's like 22 caliber, like 218s, stuff like yep. that. Why do they do that? Board diameter V groove diameter. What? So, well, you see 224. Right. You see 219, 218, 221. What's yeah, so? There's the, well, there's oh, the, got it. Two twenty-two. There is there a two twenty-two? There is. Mm-hmm. There's two two twenty-twos. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot. It's a lot. Two twenty Swift. Yep. Okay. I think like naming convention aside, um, some of it has uh, you know like groove diameter, V bore diameter, and some of it is just we needed to come up with something a little bit different. Like right, because yeah. otherwise you're going to have like twenty of the same yeah, sounding right. name. Yeah. Okay, got it. Because it's so popular to take a cartridge and neck it down to 22, right? That if all of them are 22X, you're going to run out of things That's good that make name. any sense. 20, I don't know why we're not inventing that right now. Patent pending. We yeah. invented something on the last podcast that both you guys were on, so now, now we're calling right it 22X. 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 Yeah, what did we, what did cool. we make the last time Love that it. we didn't make? Or did uh, we make it? We made, it was, a, uh, it was a 22 bullet, but we made it in oh. such a way that it had a pocket behind it where there was like the ignition charge was inside of the bullets. We could get like a really long bullet, high BC. Yeah, Seth, where are we at on that? Um, it's It's uh, been a commercial success. I've already made <laughs> millions of dollars, and I already don't know why I'm sitting here. So, yeah, um, you'll the, see me uh, on the yacht. <laughs> the difference between that day and today was that day, for some reason, we had chicken tenders. And today we have not. Mm. It's still the morning on like basically a Monday, kind of a Monday for us this week. Yeah. Um, okay. But there's, so let's talk, getting into stuff that's smaller than 22 caliber. Yeah. Arguably, I'd say the most common one is 17. Yeah. Arguably, but maybe not. Yeah. 17 is big. Uh, has been for quite some time um, from the wild basement wildcatter forward so like late 50s on up 17 people glommed onto it um, and i don't know why i don't know why 17 itself you know maybe air guns were 17 and they were maybe. they hmm. were looking at that 0. 0.172 0. 0.177 diameter and they're like well let's just make it center fire or rim fire capable mm-hmm. um, above that you know air gun threshold and start playing with it and and it did take off and it's still prevalent today uh so yeah, we break this out then into two categories we have rim fire sub bore or micro bore whatever you want to call it and then you have center fire which they're two yeah, right. two center wildly fire. different creatures yes um so predating even the 17 would be the five millimeter remington magnum which was a cartridge that existed for such a brief window of time that a lot of folks have never heard from it it was re reintroduced from a gila they started loading that ammo probably 15 years ago Maybe a little bit more than that. They have great taste, of course. Yeah, yeah. They've <laughs> always they've always been good on um, unusual and obscure cartridges and chamberings. Um, Our kind of people. Yeah. I mean, I've never heard of that. So where where would one even find the firearm to shoot this in the 1960s? <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So were you bring, breaking out the time machine? Then? Yeah. So oh, yeah. far as I know, nothing else came out. Maybe Taurus released a revolver in five millimeter Remington Magnum, or it was talked about for a, a brief period. I know Aguila made ammo just for a, a small quantity annually, and they still may, uh, but it's a, a rimfire case that if you look at it and you put it next to like a 17 Mach 2 or a 17 HMR, remarkably similar. Hmm. Um, they do very, very similar things. But again, it was it was so obscure and for such a short amount of time that it, it almost didn't exist. On the Richter scale, it was an anomaly um, that, you know, whoever was reading the chart was like, ah, yes. Still yeah, it's nothing. <laughs> right. Um, and then, oh, somebody shut the door, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> and then that was about it for the rimfire side of things for a long time and until... 
uh, the 17 HMR and, and HM2 came out uh, and then enjoyed enormous commercial success as this really cute, fun um, step up in rimfire performance. Both of them are. Uh, I've never even heard of the HM2, to be honest with you. You know, it's funny. I think it's the better cartridge of, huh. the, of the two. Like, if you look at them on paper. Like Scary Movie 2. Is. <laughs> that's a good. It's the parallel. Uh, but is it still around, the HM2? It, it is, yeah. But it never, ever caught the same fire that the, the HMR did. What was um, the difference between them? So the HMR is built off the 22 Win Mag case. The HM2 yeah. is built off a case called the 22 Stinger. Mm. which is uh, a lengthened 22 long rifle that used a lighter weight 22 caliber shorter 22 caliber bullet for use in 22 long rifle guns so it should be noted as like a, a distinct chambering difference like 22 stinger is not 22 long rifle in in the conventional sense it's slightly different mm-hmm. um but 17 hm2 was 22 stinger neck down to 17 okay um but you could still run it in the same length action. So, like, if you had, at the time, Magnum Research was the one who was really pushing the gun in their in their little auto loader, uh, the HM2. So it used the standard BX10 rotary magazine. For I was going to ask 10, if 22. you can use the same magazine. Yeah, mm-hmm. you can. Yeah. Okay. And it was like a barrel swap. If you had a, oh. a 1022 and you got a 17 HM2 barrel, you just put the new barrel on and pretty much went to town. You should respring too. But uh, a lot of folks didn't. You just got like a Green Mountain barrel or a Magnum mm-hmm. Research Magnum Light barrel and popped it on your 1022 and you were ready to party. Um, Savage also had that and Marlin had that chambered in, in their bolt guns as well. Yeah. Uh, but that that to me was the darling cartridge in the 17 Rimfires. Mm, but okay. never, never caught on with the same degree of What about popularity. the, uh, honestly, it's like, uh, I think it was just a naming thing actually. But uh, what's in a name? A lot of things. What about the Mach 2 then? That is the Mach 2. Oh, so, so yeah, the HM2. The HM2 the Mach is 2. the... That's just if you're, you know, like oh. slang on the streets. That's yeah. what we call it. The yeah, HM2. HM2, Mach 2. Gosh, it is like a Monday, Tuesday. Way what? cuter, too. Like when you look at it, you're like, that is way cuter than the 17 HMR. Hmm. And that, maybe that's what I, I like, that cute little cartridge. What's the What are reasonable expectations out of like a 17? I know there's plenty more 17s we can go into, but in terms of, you know, like I got a 17 HMR because I just heard that it was like great for farm and stuff like that. I, yeah. People kept saying it vaporizes, vaporizes them, which I'm I'm actually all for. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Jim stands for vaporizing. What is, what is it about them? Um, gosh, I have so many questions about it. I'll just start with that one. But uh, what, what can you expect? Um, so... It, it does offer a ballistic advantage over the 22 in terms of like trajectory and, and to a point um, when wind deflection, like it's got a higher BC, so it's not as affected by wind. One thing it wasn't, and I remember when it really came out onto the scene, uh, I worked at a gun shop. There was a gun shop down the road. A fellow down the road was telling people it was a great 300-yard coyote round, no. which it oh. is absolutely not. It did, it did have this like magic bullet mystique. Like yeah. look at this amazing tiny little thing <laughs> that can do – you know, I'll, anything, and some it things. just, it just kind of like it's good, like it's just really good. But yeah, it's not that. Uh, I think for gophers, uh, woodchucks, um, the occasional mustelid and possum, maybe it was fantastic. Um, prairie dogging with a rimfire that was a that was a new adventure with a HMR and HM2, I think more mm-hmm. than HMR. Uh, but but it did offer like a, a 200 yard solution for varminting, mm-hmm. uh, that that in a rimfire package that was, you know, low impact, low noise. Um, Small, like the smaller varmints like yeah. you're talking about. The Little stuff. Because, like, I mean, I've shot prairie dogs with a HMR before, and, yeah. you know, it's not doing the same thing that, like, a 223 is going to no. do. Like, they kind of, I mean, you, you can hit you hit them, and they just kind of go, ugh. Right. You know. It, it doesn't have the pop that right. I think a lot of people thought it did. Because it's really not that fast. It's a 17-grain bullet at 2,550 feet per second. Mm-hmm. So yeah. mm-hmm. everybody always acts like it's like coming out like a absolute lightning. Bolt. Right, and it, it's compared not. to a twenty-two. It yeah, is. yeah, true. Right, yeah. Is that why the BC is higher? Is just is it just it's speed in that case? Because isn't a wouldn't a twenty-two bullet be bigger and heavier? It, it is, but the profile of the bullet. So like the seventeen HMR bullet, the seventeen V Max that that it's really famous for is a, a boat tail design with a polymer tip. It's a very sleek bullet. Is there one behind you? Uh, matter of fact. There is on the cartridge board here. Let's see if I have the the cordage allowance. Oh, gosh. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Yep. So we have the Mach 2. See, way cuter. 
and then the HMR. Oh, the Mach 2 is way cuter. A super cute cartridge. I was expecting it to actually be the bigger one because you were saying how much like better it was, and we went into this earlier. Bigger is always better. Well, <laughs> I think functionality and interchangeability helps. Yeah. So we got a Mach um, 2 and an HMR here, Marco. Especially if you if you're doing this as a project, which I think it's probably safe to say that the Wildcats and a bunch of the small bore hmm. stuff is it starts out as 22 is great or 223 is great. But what if? And I th- like that thought process is how we end up with a lot of these quirky little things. Yeah. And so if I was yeah. going to take like my CZ457, right? Yeah. And I already like my 22 long rifle length magazines and I want a 17 cartridge, I would choose a cartridge or make a cartridge that's going to be compatible with my magazines and the rest of the rifle system. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I think why I'm inclined to agree that the Horny Mach 2 was the superior cartridge is because I'm already like yeah, bought and sold on 22 yeah. long rifle, not 22 magnums. I don't want longer magazines. I don't want a different bolt throw. I want to just do something crazy with the rifle that I have. Do some crazy. Now, I have a 457 mm-hmm. in 17 HMR, mm-hmm. and I just did a quick barrel swap and a mag swap, and I switched it from 22 to 17 HMR. And that mag swap. Yeah, and that is... But you, the, kind of unique to, to that, the CZ, to the to the CZ, and a couple okay. other guns like the Saco Quad. Sure. Um, so maybe I shouldn't have picked that rifle. Well, no, but, but where you were going though, like let's go back to the 1022, which was like probably the most customizable firearm outside of the AR-15 for a long time. Yeah, yeah no doubt. Um, th- there is a very distinct action difference, whereas your 457 okay. is very flexible in that it can go into a magnum rimfire chambering and then back out of into a standard rimfire chambering. But the 1022 could not. You ha- you had to either have a 1022 or a 1022 Magnum. Okay. Um, the 1022 Magnum is rare as hen's teeth, and if you have one, they're extremely expensive. Like they're selling for over a thousand bucks now, um, just because they were a limited run, uh, very volatile cartridge to chamber in an auto loader at the time. They had tungsten bolts, so they were expensive to produce. Steel receivers. Um, as opposed to the aluminum receiver on the 1022. So you, you'd be less inclined, one, to find one, uh, and then two, to goof around with it just because mm-hmm. it's going to detract from the value of the gun or potentially end up in catastrophic failure, and you crack the receiver with that very heavy tungsten bolt. Um, so to Seth's point, being able to unplug the barrel from a 1022 via two small screws just under the barrel and pop in a new Green Mountain or Magnum Research barrel, and you're up and running... Uh, you could do this in your garage, and the 17 HM2 then it would be the the better choice. Yeah, I can see that being yeah. the case. Un- until the CZ came out uh, and and enjoyed its success that it has now, you didn't really have that option short of being a custom gunsmith and having access to a lathe and and chambering equipment and that kind of thing. Um, you know, because like the Savages, for instance, the 93 R17s, mm-hmm. you you didn't take a, a 93 chambered in 22 mag and turn it into a 17 with any degree of ease right you know you'd have to have the the tooling and facilities to do that 1022 you could do it though so mach 2 gets my nod Mm -hmm. what's funny to me also is seeing um the return of the 22 long rifle after we did all of these exploratory what ifs with sub calibers and everything else and i think that part of what's made that possible um shameless optics plug is the fact that we now have affordable first focal plane high magnification optics mm-hmm. with good resolution that allow you to understand and utilize the ballistic performance of the 22 mm-hmm. long rifle hmm. as opposed to something with a flatter trajectory like a 17 that's mm-hmm. faster. But because, um, like we, we talk about the same being true with like a 30 caliber versus 65 caliber, you generally are getting the heavy for caliber, long, um, slippery bullets that maintain their velocity better rather than being high velocity to begin with. And as you're stretching out the range of something and trying to have a predictable trajectory at distance, um, rather than want something that just doesn't deviate from your line of sight very much, and then you just have a kind of a cutoff where the energy runs out, Mm -hmm. you now are able to take something where well, my optic has all the information in it that I need to be able to stretch the legs on this cartridge mm-hmm. as much as I want. Well, and so the other tech to go along with it, ballistics calculators, exactly. range finders, you know, all these yeah. things that yep. you just didn't have before. So it's like, before it was like, yeah, 
add more velocity. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Very astute observation. That, yeah. Same thing that happened in the big big bore mm-hmm. like uh, big game hunting cartridges. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're kind of kind of gone full circle because a lot of cool companies have made optics with high end features more accessible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I wish we knew some. Yeah. Weird. Hey, speaking of uh, adding more velocity, here's one that I feel like I don't hear a lot about, but it seems really cool to me, the 204. Mm-hmm. Mm. Was a cool cartridge. I was at... Oof, um was. <sighs> the old d- yeah. just demeaning was. Well, I mean, it still is. It's just <laughs> uh, when it came out, it was it was like the first real commercial over 4,000 feet per second loading out there Gosh, that's like so i already cool. want it just yeah that. i'm getting goosebumps just hearing <laughs> over four thousand. yeah per second. so i think I the like, the original chambering was a 32 grain v max at 42 25 oh. now i loaded for that Who cartridge want that i could Surprise. never i could never get the cartridge to go over four grand when i was loading for it and it could just be because i had a really bad chronograph and maybe like does not compute <laughs> at that level, you were but, probably <laughs> at like five right um but i i remember when that cartridge came out and thinking like I had just gotten into like calling coyotes Mm -hmm. and thinking like, I'm doing it wrong. I'm shooting a 223, like wasting my time. (laughs) Um, but, uh, really neat cartridge. I think it's like the ultimate prairie dog and red Fox cartridge. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, if I was going to assign a cartridge to a species, uh, real low recoil. It's based off the 222 Remington Magnum case, which is different than the 222 Remington case. So that gets a little wild too. Uh, but yeah, 20 caliber, um, which had also been out for some time. There's a couple other 20s that that came out that I think pushed the development of the 204 Ruger that that have notable mention like 20 Practical, 20 Tactical, uh, 20 Vartarg, um, 20 Fireball, which is kind of a derivative Ooh, of one fireball. of those. Yeah. Yep. Um, and yeah, it was a really neat thing. I think there was a, a Jim heard fireball. He's like, are we going ice fishing? What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> I think so there was, was a, like my Saturday night, a resurgence in varmiting at about the time that the 204 came out. Um, and there again, though, I think that cartridge was also wrought with a little bit of, um, expectation V reality and, and that people were like, well, now it's a 500 yard coyote cartridge. And at the end of the day, it's Whoops. still a very lightweight, thin-jacketed projectile, albeit being pushed at very, very high velocity, just didn't carry the WAP necessary to, to you know, ethically put down a 30 to 40-pound canid right. at extended distances. How is it that a thin-jacketed, very small projectile can go 4,000 miles, or I'm sorry, not miles <laughs> per <laughs> dang it, feet per second, <laughs> Uh, without just completely delaminating and coming apart. It does. And that, that was kind of part of the problem. Okay. So if they hit with too high velocity, you get no penetration, um, and it just, like, grenades. Right. Uh, and just the coyote's sub, like, ah. Just subsurface. Yeah, less than, uh. less than exceptional results. I knew a lot of guys that were, um, like, big coyote callers that if it was, like, 200 and in, smoked. Um, but after running into some coyotes at extended distances or further than that, they're like, man, I really wish the bu- bullet weight was a little bit higher. Yeah. Had a little bit more retained energy or just penetrating power. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of them went back to 223 or 22, 250 because they wanted that extra punch. Um, but it is still a delightful cartridge to shoot. So 223 has negligible recoil. 204 is just sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, and, Perhaps we'll get into this too. Maybe the undoing of a lot of these sub bores mm-hmm. is with that increased velocity comes a lot of other problems like bowling. Um, and then one uh, sub bore that I think probably set the precedence for a lot of other sub bore center fires was the 17 Remington. Um, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of requests for people uh, from people for us to talk about the 17 yeah. Remington. Um, so, there again, same case 222 Remington Magnum neck down to 17. Uh, Pushed a, I think it was a 25 grain was the about standard right. load. Somewhere there. Very fast, had terrible fouling problems. Uh, part of it was just rifling process and barrel steels at the time that it came out. And then two, uh, it's a very small projectile. It's going very fast. And so mm-hmm. they'd, they'd copper out really quick and then your accuracy would just be gone. So, when, so fouling and coppering out. Like the out, barrel would. Yeah. Okay. Just foul out and you'd have to clean it quite often gotcha and for a varmiting cartridge and if we're, we're thinking of varmiting i guess in my head i'm thinking you know prairie dog shooting or um 
what do you call them out where you're from? Rock chucks? Groundhogs. Groundhogs. Okay. Yeah. Groundhogging. Um, yes. <laughs> great cartridge to do it, but typically higher volume. And then oh, yeah. you'd foul out and you'd lose your accuracy while you're out there. And then I'm like, well. Yeah, that sucks. I guess it was cooler when I had my 223 and I could just do this all day and not have to worry about anything. Uh, but it is a really neat cartridge. And it, it did kind of set in motion a lot of the sub bore craze. Um, and there's a couple other 17 center fires that, that were kind of hot too. One of them, kind of the short version of that was a 17 Mach 4 that then became commercialized as the 17 Fireball, um, which was the 221 Fireball neck down to 17. And it got most of the same performance that the 17 Remington did in a smaller case. Mm-hmm. And those are center fire, you said? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, is it just the fact that they're a center fire that they're usually the ones that were like really screaming? Yeah. Yep. So you can do that with a... With a rim fire? Not to the same degree. So, and is that why? Why just, is it? Was it about the case that case volume? Yep, case yep. volume length. Oh. Yep. So, and there's no ability to reload the the rim fires, right? Yeah. So if people are really trying to push the limits of something, you're stuck with what's commercially loaded. Yeah. So yeah, like right. a, a 17 HMR, 17 grain B max, 2520 or 2550 um, for velocity. The 17 Mach 4, 25 grain. VMAX, 4,000 feet per second. Oof. Yeah. So that's where the Mach 4 comes from. Um, I remember Cooper chambered that cartridge for a long time. Like, and they provided you with, like, load data for the the cartridge when, when you bought the gun. And then you'd have to get dyes from, like, RCBS or Redding or somebody. Cooper and does cool stuff like that. They do. Cool I feel like stuff. whenever I yep. hear about Cooper, it's always, like, some very just neat yep. oddity. That- Kind of the only quote production custom rifle where you can still get a twenty tac, a twenty prac, a twenty vartard, um, you know all those. What what are these ones? Yes. The twenty tac, <laughs> prac, vargarg. I mean, it just sounds like did somebody start? Somebody was on the keyboard and was like, oh, I don't know, we need a name. I was so, gonna say, frankly, it sounds like Ryan's making things up and just seeing if we'll nod. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So. Uh, so oh, the vartard. Of so course. the the non <laughs> the the non commercial twenty calibers. <laughs> Uh, like 20 practical, for instance, is a 223 neck down to 20 caliber. So it's practical oh, in that you already on. have brass. You neck it down. Slight performance disadvantage to the 204 Ruger. Um, the 20 Vartarg, I think that's a 221 fireball base case, correct? Okay. You're so outside it, of my wheelhouse. So there's, mm, there's you're on your own, pal. 20 yeah. <laughs> tactical then. The 20 so. tactical, I believe, is the non-commercialized version of the 204. Somebody fact check me on this, please. Uh <laughs> And again, practical being the 223 neck down to 20, the tactical being slightly more. 5.56 five, neck down. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and then the, <laughs> the, the Vartarg being, I think, the, the 20, 221 Wildcat. It's really something. Right. It is, yeah. Um, but really common, or was kind of common for barmeting, for prairie dogging and okay. stuff like that. Cute so little cartridges. If you know. Uh, to have reasonable expectations, mm-hmm. and also you don't shoot as much according to the fouling and all that other stuff. I think a lot that of that's been be mitigated now. With Which is different projectile design or something? That like jacket and or? powder technology too. Hmm. Um, so there's some powders that have a like a chemical property that aids in copper fouling. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the more common commercially available is the CFE powders. Um, so copper fouling extreme i think is what the e stands eliminator. for yeah oh yeah it is eliminator yep mm. good guess yep so you can get that <laughs> it's um, like it's like of having a fuel additive in your gas yeah i don't know if it's gimmick or not because i don't shoot that powder um i know a lot of folks that do yeah. in in pistol and and center fire and yeah. they love it like it's meters well it's very consistent and, bunch of three gunners i know yeah. i like them because they don't like clean anything yep it's <laughs> good True. powder but True. um yeah. Well, what what about you know we're talking about some of these you know small super you know hyper velocity cartridges, um, which would be well suited for things like prairie dogs, mm-hmm. which can be high volume shooting. What are we talking like you know going back to like the the two hundred four or seventeen rem or something like that? What what are you talking barrel life then? Mm, the seventeen rem had a pretty jaded history and reports vary, right? People are like, I fouled out and it's shot out in 400 rounds. And I've talked to other guys that have used 17 Remingtons, like first, second, third year production guns, and they were burning down prairie dog towns with them, just having like a judicious cleaning schedule with them. And they were Mm -hmm. aware of it, or they were hand loading themselves using better propellants, Mm -hmm. not running into that problem. And they're like, I've got 2000 rounds to my 17 Rem. Um, 
It's it's kind of an obscure enough cartridge now that you just don't hear about it anymore. My buddy uh, Mike Scoby, uh, mm-hmm. when we used to hunt together a fair amount, he was quite fond of his 17 Remington. So we'd go, he'd he'd coyote hunt with that. I killed yep. one coyote with it, yep. and it did very well. Yep. It was actually at very close range, and mm-hmm. you know, just dumped it and definitely no pelt damage. Like no. it was really cool. And then, but then conversely. Um, he shot one one time, and I don't know if he hit it in the shoulder or what, but like you said, it was like, we got it. But, but not, it, not, that was my experience with the 17 pretty. HMR. I mean, it was yeah. like, but like pelt damage extraordinaire. Like, I'm, I've never seen Grenaded like a, on the a surface. wound like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah flap injury. Ugh. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so I think it's funny, though, if we look at a lot of those, and when they came out, maybe two things happening in tandem. One, metallic cartridge reloading became a thing, and like the tinkerer, um, that was the ho- home hobby gunsmith and reloader pioneered a lot of these cartridges, a lot of these sub bores in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. At the same time, hides were still worth something. Mm-hmm. So people were out yeah. hunting hide. Like a fox was 50, 60 bucks like when my uncle and my mom were in high school. And back then, that was a ton of money. Yep. My, my uncle put himself through college on fur, which is really crazy to think about. You that can't, is crazy. You can't do that anymore. No. So the hide hunter... I, I think had a lot to do with that too, where people were looking for uh, an option for, for taking a coyote or a, a, a fox without doing extraordinary pelt damage. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. out of that necessity spawned these cartridges. Um, you know, their, their practicality is of course subjective uh, because it wouldn't be my first choice. I think I would just do a different bullet in something like a 223 or 243 where I wouldn't have that problem. At the time though, they didn't exist. I was going to say, yeah, yeah now, we right? Didn't, we didn't have the VMAX bullet in you know 1968 so you just didn't have that option you were stuck with a soft point and the only way to keep it from chunking out a big piece of your critter was go smaller faster mm-hmm. so that it just didn't have the penetration and popped on the inside but um what did their bullets look like that were in the 17s and stuff like that back then soft points soft points yep hmm. or or little hollow points that had interesting closures on the on the nose i kind of wonder how the first guy to start thinking 17 should be a thing like made those tiny little bullets yep little hollow points that'd be pretty wild yeah you said you got didn't you get to see the process of like how they make the yeah. 17s now when i was at it was the first and second time i had toured the hornady facility in grand island nebraska they've got this little um loading machine so the facility's phenomenal if you're in the grand island air stop and it's beautiful with the 17 HMR machine at the time reminded me of like a regular home fridge mm-hmm. uh, made out of uh, Lexan or plexiglass and all these cool little mini tools in there, um, inserting the Delrin tip into the bullet, forming the bullet, spitting the bullet out, and then the loading process was just miniaturized as well, uh, where they had like instead of this table length long thing for taking rifle brass and turning it into rifle ammunition the end it was just miniaturized um and so all these little 17 grain v maxes spinning out into a, a bucket basically on the ground everything was just super scaled super cute and pretty high tech in comparison <laughs> to like the other machines that were making bullets at that time and don't they just crank them yeah like just it's like beep, beep, beep. yep they were just flying out of that little machine and these teeny little seeds little red tips little <laughs> tiny copper jackets just spitting out it's like wow that is neat and uh, yeah, like the size of a fridge, maybe a little bit larger than a home fridge, but not much bigger. That's amazing. It was my, it was, I think it was my favorite machine on the tour. I'd Absolutely. Be, yeah, yeah. hard to peel me away from watching that happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very neat. Like mm. uh, Edward Scissorhands in the movie, when, in the beginning when he's making all the cookies. That's what it reminded me of. Great film. <laughs> yeah. Another great film. Yeah. Um, okay. So how about, aren't some people making some pretty, there's actually some other very small calibers we can get into some some of the more even like outlandish ones but aren't there some people who are making some of the stuff like are they making any 17s or 20s i know they make 22s where people take like an entire like 30 odd six like the 22 odd six for mm-hmm. example take real big cases and neck them way, 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 way down is anybody doing that with like these really sub sub calibers yeah i mean the basement tinkerer still exists today i have seen a 20 creed more rendition i've not seen a 17 creed more rendition um, but it's still pretty popular to bring stuff down to 22. And I, I think a part of that has to do with once you get case volume so large and bullet diameter so small, unless you're you're turning like solid bullets. Yeah. You, Eventually you're just going to blow the they, thing up. They won't make it through the, the like 
through the rifling process. They leave the barrel and they just dematerialize. Uh, and you end up with this neat little cloud of vapor for that. Say, talk about fouling. Yes, <laughs> right. They just never leave. I see. I knew Seth was going to get to this, or somebody was going to get to it. The twenty-two year split in Loudon Boomer. Yeah, this is uh, <laughs> one of the one of the other guys we work with, uh, Connor McDermott, in the in the new product development. This is one of his favorite cartridges ever. He worked at um, he worked for Winchester uh, before he worked here, and so he's really in tune with uh cartridge manufacturing and some of kind of the oddballs and this is one of the like memes basically of the 1960s <laughs> <ammunition> <laughs> right. wildcat world um so it's a 378 weatherby magnum case necked down to a 50 grain 22 called the irgen split and loud and boomer <laughs> and the uh, speaking of made up yeah, yeah 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 and uh you can see a picture of it right there it is one of the most obtuse looking I like that word <laughs> obtuse you know that cartridges you know the uh, there's a meme out there now where it's got like the face of some little tiny like shih tzu dog on top of just like a super jacked body yeah. over body <laughs> that's exactly what this looks like yeah now has anybody actually like made 17. one chambered one <laughs> and fired it? I don't this, know right next to it this looks this could be photoshopped or real it's the 1750 and the 2250 well a lot of things wouldn't work if we did that. Right. <laughs> That's not the point, though, Ryan. The point is the point is to like, just do it yeah. anyway. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. It's a I, doozy. I, I mean, if you've, if you've got all the tools, it's one of those like, why well, not? Why not? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. I Might as well. I think I could think of a few reasons why that one. <laughs> We've done everything practical. <laughs> I just want to make chips. I'm sick of making people happy with products that make sense. Let's just, let's just, I like, I like that. Let's I don't make know. Some, I also want to point back, like if an engineer was to ever um, backhandedly insult you, he would use obtuse. <laughs> it's a very obtuse individual. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. I like that. <laughs> very Straight obtuse. out of, what's that, Morgan Freeman? I was going to say, the only time I've really heard that word used is, uh, what is a Shawshank Redemption? Shawshank, yeah. How could you be so obtuse? That's right. Geometry class. Wow. Um, <laughs> okay, now how about some of these? How about some of these more wilder ones? Like we were talking about, like we were even saying things. But prior to starting on here, I asked you guys about the like two millimeter, oh, two yeah. and a half millimeter. Then obviously there's also the uh, four point seven, if I'm not yep. mistaken. Is that the one? Is that yep. the one that's what in the, the MP7 that, that, that everybody wants, four, but nobody can get? Four point six by thirty three. Four point six, dang it. And then HK had the four point seven millimeter caseless. Okay. Oh, is the caseless one the one that was in the G11? Yeah. Oh yeah, when we um, talked about that. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that where the whole thing came up with the thing we made last time, or no? What, like the the, the twenty two? Yeah, we were talking about caseless, I think, and then we were like, "Well, wait a minute, what is a case and why? Right? What if we just use the bullet as the case?" Seth, write what this down. The bullet is yeah. the case. Yeah. Ob- Obturation. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, like four point six and four point seven two millimeter calibre was one that Seth was talking about before we started, mm-hmm. which is. Is there any practical? I mean, it's it's a personal defense weapon, uh, in, allegedly. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, personally defending yourself against what flies? I don't know mice on your table. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> I I don't know. It was. It said that it uh, had underwhelming performance. Shocking. <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah, shocking. And uh, <laughs> and would only penetrate like ten millimeters of pine board, and so it was. Wow. Uh, yeah. Unimpressive, but wait a minute though. What more do you need? Uh, I mean, a lot, but <laughs> yeah, a fair bit. You know, if somebody was wearing, um, well, y- yeah. you know, like a, a, like a armor suit made out of Reynolds wrap tinfoil, they'd probably be okay. I mean, if you especially if you'd have to aim uh, perfectly for just the eye, and you hope they're not blinking when the bullet. <laughs> so <laughs> I was uh, when we went me- when we went metric there. I got my millimeters mixed up there for a second, but yes, that is not yeah. very a third of an inch. It was a really disappointing penetration performance right. out of a projectile. So. If you don't leave, I'm going to shoot you yeah. with my real gun. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I mean the, the two millimeter Calibri, I think, is one of those. Uh, joke cartridges also i think it would be fair to say the whole <laughs> cartridge like when every shot is a warning shot yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's puff 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 i'm so angry um the whole cartridge is like 11 millimeters long at its widest point the case is three millimeters in diameter wow it's a two millimeter projectile and um at the time 
they didn't even have the ability to rifle bores that were that small. And so that was one oh, of the yeah. chief complaints about this is that it they couldn't stabilize bullets or do anything. So it's a smooth bore, oh my gosh. two millimeter, hilariously inaccurate and underpowered joke. Um, and the other odd thing is that it would headspace off the case mouth. So there was no no like significant taper to the cartridge or anything. And they just turned down the diameter right before the bullet and it would headspace off the mouth of the case rather than like the shoulder or the rim yeah. where where things would normally headspace. So that it's just an oddball. I think people like the oddballs. Yeah. Um, so whenever somebody gets into the argument of like, well, do you think a twenty two caliber like a twenty two long rifle will be adequate as a self defense cartridge? Well, it's better than a two millimeter. That is correct. <laughs> yeah. Better than a two millimeter calibre. And you can still buy those um, miniaturized pin fire guns. Yeah. I've almost, I've almost done it several times just to say I've done it because like you can get a miniature pin fire in like an 1885 high wall. That would be and rowdy. The tricky part is handling the cartridges themselves because they're so tiny that you can accidentally crunch one by picking it up. <laughs> it's like if you're trying to like pick up a butterfly, you've oh, got to be yeah. really careful <laughs> <laughs> because the, the, uh, propensity to damage it is is just by touching it um so yeah the practic- probably the oils from your fingers add like three grains of weight or something to the or yeah <laughs> not three <laughs> grains but like just some percentage that's just ungodly and right the bullet right yeah the practicality of those i think is nil uh novelty more than anything kind of like your 22 ear split and loud and boomer thing right but that's a dangerous novelty yeah well, i think yeah two millimeters at least mostly harmless Right. I don't know. It hails back to a great time when, you know, pre-internet, right. what is there to do except make firearms that are nonsense and or pure entertainment. So if we were ready to leave this topic, I think that would have been a, a good segue into like the gallery guns yeah. and, and the, the 22 shorts and things like that. Yep. So 22 long rifle is great, right? Has lots of practical purposes. Phenomenal lawn uh, tool. As yes. you said, yeah. Garden defense uh, artillery instrument. It's great for that. But some things that it might not be so great for is let's say you're in a bar shooting the breeze and 22 long rifle is pretty loud to shoot inside at tin cans and things for fun. And so what if we cut the case length in half? And what if even that was too much? And so we decided to not even put any powder in it and just prime a case and put a 22 bullet on the end or just crimp a BB in there and see if we could, you know, have darts that you, you get could to use shoot. a rifle instead of darts. I like that. <laughs> Great bargain. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly right. And I think a lot of these older sub, 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 micro chamberings, whatever else, um, were pure entertainment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that's... I think I've mentioned this before, and I know that my dad does not know what a podcast is or how to listen to it, but I used to shoot his Ruger Mark II in the basement with twenty two Calibri. He'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> He'll never know. I never missed. But powderless uh, primed case, very small projectile in there. What were they, like a 20 grain? If that. Yeah, little yeah. pointed, um, goofy-looking twenty two bullet. Not recommended to shoot out of rifle length barrels because they they would sometimes get stuck um <laughs> so if you shot them out of a pistol very quiet the obturation is too strong yeah i know that i know for certain that probably my brother and sister were upstairs while i was doing this and they had no idea so the 22 the what'd you have Did you have a little bullet trap down there what'd you have yeah by bullet trap you mean yellow pages but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not to say yeah. the unfinished concrete wall right yeah. so the 22 calibri that's the same as the 22 CB. That's right with the conical bullet, and the 22 BB was the ballistically inferior version of a ballistically inferior cartridge. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, it's tricky to navigate right. uh, the nomenclature almost anywhere in the cartridge world, but especially in just slight tweaks of already obscure nonsensical Could, things. One would have to ask too with the 22 BB cap. Why not just have the Red Rider? And I suppose at that time the Red Rider didn't exist. I don't know when the Red Rider True. came out. Yeah. We shoot our Red Rider in here all the time. Yeah. Airtight seals are hard, man. Yeah. Like 
whether you're using synthetic materials or like leather Mm O-rings, having a pump air gun system would actually probably have been harder than loading a a rimfire. Sure. Sure. You know, Lewis and Clark employed air guns. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. That's what we talked about in our air gun podcast. I think that was after the cast. Oh, after the cast. Well, maybe partly during, in the cast, but then we learned the weird little details about Lewis and Clark after that's, the cast. Maybe that's was, what it was. <laughs> but, but yeah, uh, they did. Yeah. They would impress it the natives. It was like a show of force. With their 30-yard capable air guns. I'd be impressed. I, I agree. I agree. Well, how do we... Oh, yeah, we derailed. We are talking about subcalibers. We got into air guns. Um, which most are subcalibers. And didn't they use, mm-hmm. like, uh, mm-hmm. how are they compressing their air? They are basically... They had like a canister on the bottom. Yeah. You had to pump it though. They had to charge it. Yeah. It was, a, I think, a brass canister that went underneath what would be, I guess, the quote chamber, and then that was charged. I don't know the the charging mechanism though, like how they did it. Hmm. An intern. <laughs> Here, <laughs> on the well, expedition. Go into this until you pass yeah. out. <laughs> Figure out how to fill this up. Uh, <laughs> I, like, I like that. Often not reported. The intern that was along uh, on the. Yeah. yeah. So Can't make it. <laughs> maybe looping out. Maybe looping back to commercial viability um, or or present day available cartridges in these sub calibers. So in the rimfire world, we've got 17s, of course. We've got the 17 HM2 and barely the 17 HM2, 17 HMR, still very popular. Yeah. Right. You've got one. I love it. It's a cute cartridge. Um, and then in the center fires, the 17 Fireball still holds on. As as does the seventeen Remington, uh, but the two hundred four definitely reigning king of the sub twenty two caliber cartridges, um, with commercial viability anyway. Um, you can still get that from pretty much every major manufacturer right now that I'm aware of. Um, brilliant prey dog cartridge or varmint cartridge if you've got woodchucks or raccoons, possums, etc. Um, and it does perform fabulously on smaller things yeah uh bigger things you know once you get into coyotes you know as long as you're limiting your distance it's certainly usable cartridge um and then everything else would fall out of the commercial viability parameters and then just be weird and obscure wildcats novelty yeah yeah i'm trying to think if there's any other aside from but like going back to that one i mean we were joking around about the 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 viability of a two millimeter self-defense cartridge but then i mean not far off we do go back to that HK MP7 yeah. four point. What is it? Which one is it? Four six, six. Or seven. Four point six millimeter cartridge there. I mean, that's supposed to be in the hands of special yeah. tier one operators, and you know, like going against bad guys. And I mean, so what the heck are they doing there? That's so much different than. I mean, how are they actually? Was that just an experiment gun? Was that a novelty no, gun or what? I mean, it, it seems like people. So the it's the I guess the classic PDW concept of smaller caliber higher velocity more controllable higher rate of fire so yeah. super compact okay. gun yeah. not much larger than a, a long slide pistol lengthwise anyway i guess they're pretty long they're with even with the stock collapsed they're about the size of an hk mark 23 <laughs> so uh and then super high rate of fire uh in in decent terminal ballistics uh, but very controllable too. Recoil is is almost not even factored in because they are just they just hum um, when they're going. So are they doing something different with the bullets that we can't? Is it like one of those things where we can't get these kind of bullets on the civilian that, market? That's what, the other part of it too. What's in them that makes them so? Either the able. core, like the core structure, like if they have a penetrator round, they'll have a, a penetrating component to the core itself okay. or the nose of the bullet. Um, and that was the other part of this, right? Be able to defeat armor. Like a helmet or a vest, yeah. Um, inside of this package, whereas like the MP5 or MP5K or Uzi or some other submachine gun chambered in 940 or 45 couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, enter the 46 by 33 or the 57 by 28, um, where that was like the prerequisite for the design. Had to be able to defeat armor at distance with a high cyclic rate and very controllable fire. Just pump them full of incredibly hard grains of rice. Yes. I, I don't think there was a precedence on so much stopping power as penetrating power and controllability. Or even financial feasibility. Correct. And I think that's <laughs> why it was not successful commercially. I sure. think to circle back to the economics, the like 
German fallacy of value classically is like, well, it's great because it solves exactly this problem. Right. Regardless of all of the other trade offs that everyone <laughs> else would ordinarily <laughs> think is a huge trade off. We've left a wake of of inviability and yes. destruction in our path. <laughs> yeah. But we but, but we've we did exactly perfection. what you said. That's yes. exactly right. Which is a resounding theme in all the sub wars. Yeah. I think so. Huh. It's like we've sacrificed a lot of sensibility to do one thing way better than we could before. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then when people try to do something different than that one thing with it, they get a little salty because yeah. it, it's not meant to do anything, <laughs> but it's what it's meant to do. We're yeah. choosing it wrong. Which yeah. is why you don't see the 17 Mach 2 or HMR in these long-range rimfire performances. Right. Um, because, one, they don't have the consistency that the 22 LR mm -hmm. does. And to speak to why that... Cartridge has enjoyed this major resurgency in, in competition shooting mm -hmm. and specifically this long range stuff. It's because that stuff, the good stuff anyways, good ammo will put up SDs and ESs a lot of times similar or better than a lot of centerfire stuff. Yep. And so if you can map it and you can control it and you know all the variables and it's not wildly all over the paper, you can shoot long range with it and do so pretty easily. Um, at my former employment, we tried for a long time to make an AR-15 chambered in 17 HMR. And we couldn't because there was some pretty wild numbers coming over mm. the chronograph. Um, and when running it in an auto-loading system, it just didn't work. Hmm. And and that's why, I mean, my hat's off to Bill Alexander because I think he's the only guy that's really gotten that figured out um, with that interesting hybrid system that he had for the HMR AR. Um, like it's stuck in a bolt gun or a single shot. Yeah. Like that's that's it. Um, but the consistency of the twenty two long rifle and the forgiveness of it is what's made it viable and not the subchamberings. I think there's a lot of incentive from ammunition manufacturers to make the highest performing 22 long mm -hmm. rifle possible. Mm -hmm. What with the Olympics and other competitions mm -hmm. kind of widely adopting it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's a lot of um, extremely precise engineering development and metrology that goes into making something as consistent as possible. Mm -hmm. Bentress shooters, all the same things. Um, and it's nice to not have to contend with um, going supersonic and back transonic again and, and all those other things. You can do it with a predictable round nose lead bullet mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because you're not asking it to do more than you yeah. want to do. You mentioned something there, the Olympics. Um, what's really cool is biathlon, mm -hmm. which you're speaking of probably more than anything, uh, for a long time, the Russians dominated it with a, a sub bore compared to everybody else with the 220 Russian. Hmm. Like, that was their secret sauce. Oh, the 220 Russian. I remember it. We've mentioned this before. Yeah. It's the parent case for like the 545 by 39 and the 762 yeah, yeah, by 39. Yeah. Um, so that was like a sub bore by, by date standards. Um, whereas a lot of other people were shooting like 30 out six and eight millimeter Mauser and uh, <laughs> yeah. everything else. That the, in the biathlon? Yeah. They used to run center fire rifles. Right on. Yeah. And oh, the, really? Yep. I thought it was oh, so you'd always see somebody 22. on skis and they actually get up there and when they got up, it'd be like, they had like, a, like a real rifle. Wow. Yeah. Ooh. And and uh, the Russians were stomping grapes and they were using a 220 Russian. And there was a lot of question as to what was this cartridge that they were running They'd snag all their brass. Nobody found it. I think by accident. Somebody, Such a Russian thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> I think by accident, if I remember yeah, the story grab right. grab all the brass before they find it. By <laughs> accident, <laughs> somebody had come across one of the cases. <laughs> interns <laughs> again. <laughs> those, those interns. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, and so the Russian sub cartridge was, was found, uh, the 220 Russian, which turned into a lot of great cartridges. Yeah. All the PPC chamberings and then the Grendel and... A whole bunch of other cool stuff. That's pretty wild. Yeah. All started with a sub bore. Hmm. Oh. Very cool. So some very practical things have come yeah. out of this as yeah. well at the same time. Yeah. Thanks, Russia. You just can't push it beyond what it's supposed to do. Right. You know? Yeah. Or you're going to be disappointed. Right. Yeah, your, your 17 HMR is not a 300-yard coyote round. No, it's not. <laughs> I feel like it's it's... I mean, this the whole point of this wasn't to like help people figure out like, which sub bore should you go for. It. That that wasn't it. It was more just a conversation. But when you go into what ninety percent of people use firearms for, which is mostly practical use, obviously the practical use that's convenient when you shoot firearms is also fun. But um, <laughs> I mean, when it boils down, there's there's it, the 
waters get so muddied by everybody who is really like into it and they're all tweaking yeah. funny things and you know like sacrificing things here to get a really specific thing here it, it muddies the water so much I feel like for when people actually start looking for something they want to use practically uh, that it makes it difficult but when you really peel it all back especially with modern day propellants and bullet uh, design and like materials and all that stuff I mean it's not that hard to figure out what to get because it's like all right if you want something like if you want something small and to do you can do lots of things with it i mean 22 it's like just get a 22 Mm -hmm. if you want something i mean it's just basically in ascending order it's like get a 22 a 223 308 or like an odd six not a, a 50 is the next well, yeah, I mean I was going to yeah. say a 50 or like a 338 I guess but even still like I mean might as well just stick with it yeah it, it's not that difficult it's just when you want to start being different or like getting a little kooky and crazy or having these really specific applications but um, the amount of times that you mentioned Ryan like the 223 for example and I'm thinking to myself like okay there's a cartridge you can whether or not you know some people will argue over its fiber but you can hunt deer with it mm-hmm. you Hunt coyotes with it, a okay. Prairie dogs, you can shoot competition with it. All kinds of competition, every kind of competition, basically with a two twenty three. Um, it's like that's just easy. Yeah. Recoil is negligible. Ammo is not everywhere, but yeah. sometimes is. Should be. It should be everywhere. It's up and down. On well, comparison. Yeah. Yeah. It is very available. You know what you could find on the shelf when the ammo got tight? Uh, well, three hundred wind mag, seventeen HMR. Oh yeah, that's why. I, <laughs> Jim, you just remembered why you bought that rifle. I did. I just remembered why. And in, in, I'm not kidding you. It was walking through the store and seeing empty shelves except for 17 HMR that I finally thought I'm gonna buy that. Yeah. The ammo availability made me buy a gun. Yeah, it is the 300 Win Mag of Garden Defense. It is. It's probably more than you need, but it'll get the job done. <laughs> Uh, it's funny actually though, despite having the 17 HMR for garden defense, I've still only shot garden, uh, destroyers with my 22. Why is that? I just haven't had the chance because I have, I, my 22 is in a different location than my 17. It's no fault. I, it, it, I've tried switching them around, but then inevitably what happens is wherever the 22 is, is where the garden critters mm-hmm. come out. Cause I think they know yep. they see he's got that 17. They're like, Oh, <laughs> the 17 don't go out. But then they're like, 22, maybe we have a chance. Ah, and then, but, um, yeah, it does the job. They're looking down the barrel, and, you know what and you, they see that red tip. You need, yeah, you need right. to get, <laughs> like, a 14 Flea or a 19 Calhoun if you want to get some weird little guns. Then they won't Why didn't know. we, we haven't talked about these. I don't know anything about those cartridges other than the briefed excerpt in Cartridges of the World, the 2002 printing. 14 like flea and 19 flea. Calhoun. We have a Calhoun here. We do have a Calhoun. I asked him. I said, you know anything about this? Well, oh, he doesn't. He's got a retention pond out back named after him. Yeah, that's Lake true. Lake Calhoun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Reportedly, there are fish in it. Reportedly. Uh, Reportedly. I don't know. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. <sighs> fun stuff. Know. Fun calibers, fun stuff. That's right. Now, we're going to have to try and find a way to splice this back into the regular podcast. But one thing, this is actually, uh, we jumped on the DeLorean. We've had a weird time warp here for a moment. And we're back in the podcast. But as usual, after we got done, we started talking about a bunch of stuff that we should have talked about during the podcast. But (laughs) one of these other 17 caliber cartridges that a lot of people want to hear about, Seth even has a question about, is 17 Hornet. Yeah, 17 Hornet. I goofed up. I'm sorry. It's... Probably one of the most popular, probably the most popular reloadable varmint. Yeah, we really goofed one. if we didn't mention it. Yeah, yeah, that was a, you would have you would you would have definitely gotten that one in the comments. Oh yeah, yeah, every comment. So here we are finding a way to put it back in. Um, Seventeen Hornet. Yeah, my personal question, I guess, is what what are you working with for bullet selection if you're loading a twenty or a, a Seventeen Hornet, which is a necked. 22 Hornet case. 17 V-Max, 25 grain V-Max, 20 okay. grain V-Max. So, yeah. you're, so I mean, pretty much the standard no, it's 17. Not a, it's not a 20 V-Max, is it? Maybe it is. I've got, I know in my uh, selection of ammo, I believe I have some Hornety stuff and some Winchester stuff. 
Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. And the Winchester, I believe, is 20 grain. Yeah, that's the... Hornady the... stuff is 17 grain. So they that's all have in, red tips, though. That's in the rimfire loading. Oh, so, right. So this is a center fire? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I'm mistaken. So it's the, the Hornady's X manual. This is their most recent. Uh, 17 Hornet is a 20 grain V Max or a 25 grain V Max, not a 17 grain V Max. Okay. Are the projectiles different between the center fire 17s and the rimfire 17s? I believe so, yeah. So thinner jacket on the 17 V Max for the 17 rimfire. 20 V Max and above is thick enough to handle the pressures yeah. oh. um, of the center fire loading. Oh, gotcha. Funny yep. story about that, actually. Uh, when I was going to college, our machine shop instructor, Jim, Phenomenal fella. Good name. Shot lots of 22 Trust- matches with him. Trustworthy uh, name. Yeah. the Only the best. He was um, working up some loads for a 22250 that he had. Again, trying to push push speed, get over that 4,000 foot per second mark. And uh, he had found <laughs> some 22 Hornet bullets, which have thinner jackets. And um, we were, he was telling me a, a story about... Uh, shooting a couple of these hand loads and this rifle ordinarily shoots spectacularly and all of a sudden he just was not hitting the target at all and the thin walled thin jacketed 22 hornet bullets he was spinning so fast at 4,000 feet per second that they were separating in the air and just oh. not even hitting the target at all are they were they separating Jeez. in the air or will they separate in the barrel as well, or could that no, happen? No, I think they hold together. It's once they leave the muzzle. Yeah, and, all, they and there's nothing it all anymore. Yeah. Holding them together. Yeah. Yep. And so the 17 Hornet would need a, a thicker jacket than the rimfire because you're pushing the velocity and spinning it faster. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah. Just poof. Mm-hmm. Uh, magic, this cartridge smoke. saw its debut in one iteration, similar to what we have now commercialized, in the 1950s. None wow. other than P.O. Ackley with the Ackley know. Hornet. Mm. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. How did we forget this? I don't know. I I, I had uh, written down that I should look into getting a 17 HM2, but what made me think about it again was like, oh yeah, on my uh, on my honeymoon of all places, I saw a CZ 527 in a gun shop and 22 Hornet. And I wanted it real bad, but I think I'd get in trouble for buying a rifle. Your wife is an incredible <laughs> woman, by the way. Because, yeah, true. on my honeymoon, I Can't swung into a, a gun shop. Thank you for um, <laughs> Hilariously, yeah. they became a Vortex dealer after that. Did visit. they really? I was so proud. Oh, outstanding. Yeah. So yeah. here's Seth makes a really good. Forgot his anniversary five yeah. years running, but he does remember <laughs> the time he saw a 22, uh, yeah. 22 Hornet in a gun shop in New Hampshire. So here's a really cool cartridge, Joe. <laughs> God, we could have talked about this for some time. 17 Hornet, you could call it like the reloadable advantage to the 17 HMR with, with a remarkable performance advantage. Yep. So 20 grain VMAX, uh, run of the mill loadings around 3,600 feet per second. Goodness. Don't tell me this. Yeah, cooking, right? Yep. So you definitely surpass the capabilities of the 17 HMR. But you can reload the cases. Uh, and that's why. I well, I'm not going to reload. And it's and it's <laughs> far more commercially viable than the 17 Remington Fireball, which would be the next step up in per- performance. Right. Um, the only problem with Hornet cases of any kind is they're so diminutive and thin mm. that they get damaged really easy. Mm. And this is why the K Hornet kind of came into um, proliferation and, and popularity is that that bump of that shoulder on the K-Hornet made the cartridge structurally more sound. Yeah. So reloading it, you had less chance to crunch it. Um, the 17 Hornet, if you want a 17, that is the one to get. Yeah, I God, think I so. Do. I feel like such a rube <laughs> for not bringing that up. An obtuse rube. Yeah, golly. Oh, that's, that's the worst. That's if, a double. Geez, that, that makes me an amalgamous blob. If you're I didn't an even think we rube, used I'm like an, that I'm, word anymore. I'm an amoeba. <laughs> not, e- not even a paramecium. Yep. Golly, uh, really cool cartridge. You can get it in the CZ 527, which is a really awesome rifle. I think you can get it in the Savage Model 25, the walking varmint or two. Probably. Yeah, which yeah. is a really neat gun. Um, oh, man. I don't know. Kind of goofed up you can on get that. it. You can get it factory loaded? Yeah. Mm-hmm. My wallet's burning right now. You got, an HMR, <laughs> you got an HMR for sale now, Jim? <laughs> I might. Well, Sounds they, fill, like they fill two different roles, though. So, like, the HMR... What, you wouldn't shoot a yard critter with a 17 Hornet? I would, but the HMR is going to be way quieter. Hmm. And uh, 
Yeah, it's more discreet. And I do, yeah. If you're if you're in an area that has a little bit higher population density, perhaps the HMR is a safer bet. Because yeah. the 17 oh. Hornet is certainly going to carry further. Yeah. Um, and you, you run a little bit more risk. Um, I wonder if my rimfire cans will handle a 17 Hornet. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to make some phone calls. That would, would be a curious thing to yeah. find out. I don't know. I, I like this, though, with the felt recoil of the 22 WMR. So nothing. Uh, and the trajectory of a 55 grain 223, <laughs> half the powder of the 17 Remington. 17 Hornet is a fun and economical cartridge for vomiting, target practice, or simply plinking. Let's get you a CZ 527. like a list yeah. of pluses. I need to, yep, that's yeah. on my list, too. Write one down for What's me, What's the difference too. between the 427 oh, yeah. and the 527? Size. Uh, 457. 457. Rimfire. Uh, why do they... Why do these country... These gun manufacturers and, and everything manufacturers in that area of the world make everything letters and numbers? Easier. It's not. Hmm. Well, you could tell if you have a cult following straight away. Yeah. It was only just <laughs> recent that I finally figure out how to even tell anybody what model I was talking about if I looked at a cool Mercedes or BMW. Oh, yeah, no, that's a that's a 330CI. Oh, no, that one over there. Oh, that one's a blah, 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 blah. It's just unbelievable. Well, yeah, darn it. still lost there. So, so just remember, if it starts <laughs> with a five in the CZ lineup, it is a center fire. With okay. respect to rifles, except the 512, which is a rimfire. See? The, that's their semi auto 22 yeah. mag. It's just coming unraveled. Yep. In a bolt gun, well. if it starts with a 5, <laughs> it is a center fire. 527, 550, 557. Okay. Um, if it starts with a 4, then it's a rimfire. Noted. Okay. Um, all right. We're going to have to figure a way to splice back in here real quick. But yep. first, but before we do that real fast... 22 Ladybug? You were, you weren't going to tell us about that one on the podcast? Either? Center fire 22 Rimfire. That every time you say that it's like I saying don't. it's like saying a cheeseburger without cheese. Yeah. It's a center fire 22, 22 Rimfire. Rimfire. Yeah. So uh 22 Rimfire case dimensionally. A little bit thicker rim with a center fire priming system. How do and, they even find enough the, room in the back of that little 22 case to put it Small primer. rifle primer. Small is it just rifle. running on, is there powder? Yeah. There is powder. It's yep. not just like a larger primer then. No. It would be a super souped up twenty two Calibri though if you ran no yeah. powder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can get one. And they one. called it the ladybug. Yeah. <laughs> they couldn't come up with like a more. A, I like it. It's unassuming. Yeah. It's like, oh, oh yeah. it's just a ladybug. Bam. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So ladybug's kind of a badass. It's like insect. Iceland like, Greenland. That's true. They are unassuming too. It's like yeah. an Iceland Greenland kind of thing. Or yeah, you think a ladybug? You're like that's a ladybug. You know, pretty. Armor what do they show. do? That, what do they yeah. do? That's cool. They're aphid. Aphid games. killers. Infestation. What are they're they? hunters. What do they kill? Aphids. You're gonna have to explain. Aphids what that eat is. your plants. Tiny, I have an economics degree, not a tiny little <laughs> like imagine a um, uh, microscopic cricket, sort of. They're not, but sort of, plant eaters. Infestations. If you they're grow not microscopic, well, they're very small. I mean, you think about the prey that a ladybug would eat. I mean, ladybugs are pretty small. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like to Seth's point, if you're thinking, if you're designing an insect, start with a ladybug. Yep. What's not to like about him? He's aerodynamic, low profile, rigid exterior. Volkswagen approved. Yeah. I mean, we're, we just talked about German engineering. They started with a ladybug. We need an insect <laughs> to out of our vehicle after. <laughs> And they they picked a good one. Yep. I mean, the other the yeah, lady Bugenstein. <laughs> oh my god! Um, and it's got a nice paint job. It's an aesthetically pleasing. Oh, insect. everybody loves the ladybug. Yeah. Polka dots, non-threatening. I yep. don't like the orange ones. Those no, aren't ladybugs. That's not though. a ladybug, right? No. Demon bugs. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're gonna casually splice our way back into the old conversation. Oh yeah, this we're just we're just gonna this will be very seamless, fluid. Three, two, one. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Of course. Uh, all right, everybody. Certainly somebody out there has listened by now, and you've probably, you're probably just kicking the car. You're throwing things around because we forgot to mention one. Go ahead and let us know what we forgot to mention uh, in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube or over on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. Eager to hear about it. Maybe we can cover it another time. Um, we didn't really come up with too many inventions in this particular one, but that's all right. 22 we X. The one. Yep. Yeah, Did we? we got a name. We got a, a trademark. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so hashtag trademark. I think that's how you do it. Um, <laughs> yes. We'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, see everybody. Bye. Bye. Guys. <laughs>
maybe the new caseless is the 22X. 17X. We could do it. Okay. <laughs> so, you it's get happening. a 22 ladybug. What's okay. a ladybug? Why didn't we talk Why about the ladybug? Why didn't you mention the ladybug? Like, in the last 30 seconds, you named like five things. I named two. Centerfire 22 Rimfire. 22 Ladybug. Centerfire 22 Rimfire? Yeah. I'm really confused now. Yeah, I use a small rifle primer on a 22 Rimfire case head. Are, we, are you picking all this up, NC Ryan? Patent pending. <laughs> so this oh, isn't no, a thing. This is, a, you've, this is, you just this is right this. now. No. It's not, wait, yeah, I can't patent that. Um, <laughs> 22 Ladybug. Centerfire 22 Rimfire case. The X bullet goes over the top of it. Mm. Mm. Even after our last discussion, I think extraction injection is going to be weird because you're just going to have a whole bunch of like, like you know, whenever you have a hole punch and then you've got all those little stupid circled discs of paper yeah. and you go to empty it and they seem to go everywhere. Yeah. That's exactly what ejecting your cases are going to look like. But and then like, good luck finding them, right? But. Have you seen the primer modules for my smokeless muzzleloader? No. Oh, so they're a 308 case head, and then a, an abbreviated, quote, body, huh. and then a stem. That stem is where you put your powder charge. The bullet goes over the top. It's perfect. 22X. Oh, what, yeah. What do we actually, use it for? I, I, now I'm, I'm picturing what you're talking about. Yeah. So you slip over that. Now, how does the bullet stay retained? with a band, and you use a swaging die that goes up mm, and crimps that. Crimps yeah. Then you just get these nice, lathe-turned, high BC, 22 caliber projectiles. Very affordable, because you make them on a Swiss machine and they go really fast. Oh yeah. And then of all the machines in the shop, that's yeah. the only one that has capacity right now, so I think that's what I'm hearing yep. uh, we're gonna have to do, is get Jason on it. And then we have to figure out how to make it work with tight group, because that's the only powder I have. And then it's a little <laughs> dipper, a little dipper, a tight group, yep. and a micro funnel, and you put it in there and you shake it, and it fills up that stem, and then you put the little bullet on there, and done. 22X. I like it. What do we use it for? 500-yard uh, rimfire competition. And coyotes at 300. <laughs> I heard dynamically, I'm Look still... at you, 300-yard coyote guy. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> I did kill a coyote at 107 steps with a 22 long rifle. Steps. steps. Your steps are quite long. Yeah, I'd Maybe so I don't like know. 0.95 yards, 0.9. It could or be. Do you think you have full yard I don't steps? Know. I've never measured it. He's a 1.1 kind of guy. When Mark, really, when Mark really strides it out, he's got a yard step. Does he? No, I just. Uh, it's not Your extreme, natural though. gait is not one yard. Yes, it is. No. Okay, but it's not an extreme stride. Either. Maybe with the beard. It's a. Uh, <laughs> Maybe when you have the beard. <laughs> it's a. I'd call it a, a conscious step. A conscious step. Mm. A metric mark yard. It's summer, baby. And the RC. Your wife finally got to you, didn't she? With the razor. Dude, I got home from turkey <laughs> hunting. <laughs> you was asleep. She was just like, <laughs> I got home from turkey hunting, and I just, I just Changed for man. It. Yeah. Walked in the door. <laughs> dart in the neck. Dart in your neck. Whoa, more. Like on Ace Ventura, when nature calls, he's running, he's got all the darts in him. <laughs> Too many darts. <laughs> That's what happened. My neighbors didn't recognize me because we yeah, moved in the, the neighborhood. Cops. They only seen me with the beard. And yeah, like, oh, my God. Really I don't know that was you. <laughs> oh, you have a face. I didn't know it was you either, so Wait. you walk in the door. And you don't even know me anymore. No, I don't. Mm -hmm. You said you'd never do it. You said you'd only do it just to hurt me. And here you are with no beard. That's not what I said. I told you it was temporary from the start. That was a long temporary. It was It was exactly hunting season. September. Is this now forever? Through the end of May. Is this now forever again? Let's see. Until the next appropriate. There's still season. bears to be hunted in June, Mark. Not for me this year, though. Oh, I see. You know who Vincent Van Gogh is? Hmm. Never heard of him. Hmm. He lopped off his ear one time. I wonder if this is something. One time. Like, For yeah, love. Is this some sort of expression of art that you're trying to do? No, it's just, it, it's summer, it's hot. I just, 
You did. You cut your beard off for love, didn't you? Was that Team Hornet? Yeah. What? We didn't talk about that. The no. what? I feel like a dumbass. I forgot about that cartridge. So let's do let's Since do a Hornet. tiny caliber. Oh wait, yeah, uh, we plus. need to, no, we need to talk about the Hornet. So let's just talk about it. Maybe Ryan can splice it. Why in. don't we just do a thing? There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.